Right. Well, it was very interesting at the very early stages of development of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, this was about 1940, that there was a meeting in Chicago where Heisenberg and Fermi and various other uh, leading physicists who really understood the potential of nuclear energy, both for good and bad, particularly weapons, actually were at the same conference and met privately at someone's house. And at that one moment, they could have changed the whole course of the war and, and history if they'd basically agreed amongst themselves that they were not going to pursue this. It, I, I think um, atomic energy would have happened, but it would have happened much later than it did in World War II, and we certainly wouldn't have had Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But it didn't happen. There was a, fail, a moral failure of these, uh, these individuals, very smart people, but things like nationalism and the danger that Hitler posed and the, 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 the threat that was there basically overrode these broad humanity um, kind of considerations. That was one of the few cases where there was some potentially human destroying technology where humans could make a decision that could have at least delayed the introduction of this. But even after it happened, even after Nagasaki, you had the beginnings of the Cold War. Now, the US had a monopoly on nuclear weapons at that time, but it was only a question of time before the Soviets developed weapons because the technology was, was out. And so um, the US tried to maintain that monopoly. They came up with a, some kind of program that was supposedly giving atomic power to the world but in a way that so advantaged the United States that no one else was buying it. So selfish concerns, national selfish concerns basically overrode the, um, the benefits of um, getting international cooperation from the beginning. But it's not at all clear that given the Cold War situation that making all this technology available would have actually uh, stopped proliferation or stopped the danger of nuclear weapons. And as you probably know, it went from atomic bomb, which was tiny compared with what uh, the hydrogen bomb was capable of delivering, and it got so bad that the and the scale of the, the weapons stockpile so large that one of the reasons we've had peace for the last 70 years is because the threat of nuclear weapons basically meant the war, any war that used them, was essentially suicide for both for, for all parties. So in a, in a sense, it's ironic that the most destructive weapon ever actually ensured peace. On the other side, the introduction of gunpowder went the other way. Anyone who could afford to make gunpowder and guns had an advantage, and it became a scramble between competing European powers to, uh, to, to master and use the technology. And once it was out, it couldn't be put back. And we're in that same situation with nuclear bombs now. So that's only a historical example of a failure of uh, moral authority to block the development of, of weapons. But there is one counterexample. So basically, um, when the Portuguese were thrown out of Japan in about 1600, um, the, the shogun basically had seen how destructive firearms were to the samurai class and basically banned firearms. And so you actually had a, a, a lethal technology that was put back in the bottle. But of course what happened was it was put back in the bottle in Japan, but other countries continued to develop um, uh, basically warfare technology. And so when Japan was forced to open up to the world again in 1860s, um, they realized just how far they'd fallen behind and of course, then they very rapidly uh, industrialized and militarized and with disastrous consequences all around. So it is possible to put the, the genie back, but it takes a strong central government to do so. And I would not like the idea of an AGI essentially controlled by a dictator, because not only would that, the dictator use it to ensure their own continued power, but all the evidence from human history is such unlimited power is 
has very bad consequences for both the power holder and the those who are controlled by it. I guess that's a good example of why we should develop a AGI that benefits everybody instead of single powers through historical example. Yes, but the problem here is when you say we, who's the we here? Um, I, because it, I think it would most likely develop in some uh, relatively small lab, relatively small group that finds the way through this uh, current maze. When that happens, it will be a localized uh, organization that has the power. And we just have to see who controls that group, what they do with it. It seems so you don't think that um, AGI, if many company, countries develop it, will um, result in some sort of mutually assured destruction uh, and cause people not to use AGI in fear of um, it turning into a big suicide, perhaps? Well, I, I just don't think you're going to have multiple AGIs like that. Once you got the first one, um, it will ensure that no others are developed and would also ensure that no one could hack it. So you couldn't have um, others, basically, you, you wouldn't have multiple AIs, you'd have just the one. But it'd be running on platforms over huge geographical areas, so you could never kill it, because there's no one point at which it, it's all uh, focused. If um, an organization rushes in to build the AI, it's not given, to my opinion, that they'll actually benefit from it, because very quickly after it, if they develop the AI, um, they may get that what they um, sort of code for, but they may not get what they want. And as a result of getting AI first, they may also destroy themselves. So it, it seems to me it should be in um, an organization's interest to develop ethical AI that benefits not only themselves, but everybody. But this is a question that's very difficult for me to sort of um, uh, address is, how can we build an what what's the motivation for an organization to build an AI that's friendly for everybody? Well, there isn't. Uh, corporations in particular are basically pathological. Their goal is to increase the return to their shareholders and at the same time pay enormous salaries to their upper management. And those goals are detrimental to society and they're not going to want to change those goals because the investment required to build the AI is quite substantial. So they want a return on investment. So they're going to exploit it for profit making. And that's going to be their primary motivation. Now, they might be persuaded to put in a few safeguards, but uh, it's not at all clear that just this kind of low-level, uh, low priority part of the development is going to get the attention it would need in order to really secure the, uh, the ethics. And part of, I think, getting good ethics is not relying on a single individual or small organization to provide the ethics. It really has to be a broad consensus. Otherwise, you get one group exploiting the other. And as we know from human history, that is the normal pattern. Do you think it's more difficult to create an AI that, that has ethics that benefits everybody than creating an AI that has ethics that benefit only a few people in upper level management of organization X? I think it's much easier to do the narrow ethics for the organization because it's just smaller. Basically maximize profit to us um, and maybe put a few constraints so it doesn't go around and figure out how to uh, bleed money off people's bank accounts and basically turn into a, uh, a natural uh, you know, criminal on the highest order. They may put some constraints on it, but probably not enough. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. That's, it, it's only large organizations that can marshal the resources necessary to build this kind of system. And they're going to have a say in what the goals of this, this super intelligent AI is. And it, they may uh, from open discussions about the dangers, understand that they really just can't 
take a narrow focus viewpoint and, and maximize it for their benefit and uh, screw everybody else, they may, they may do it in such a way that they might give themselves a bit of a preference, but they still are taking very seriously the, trying to benefit everybody. But it really just depends on the individuals, the decision makers in these organizations. And presumably the researchers that are also developing it would have some say. Although if you look at the history of the Manhattan Project, the scientists had almost no say at all in how the atomic bomb was used. <laughs>